Hello, everyone. How are we doing today? Oh man, I'm uh, I'm 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 living the dream over here. Yeah, dude. Uh, it's finally getting hot, and my allergies are back. I'm like, it's <laughs> Texas, baby. It is indeed Texas. All of a sudden. Yeah, man. Went out walking yesterday. Tried to tan my arms. <laughs> I went walking in a in a in a tank top. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I think my daughter spent like six hours at the pool yesterday. Mm -hmm. Came back a little red. Yeah, oh, not too bad. A little burnt. Mm -hmm. How you doing, Andrew? Doing good. <laughs> <laughs> we get the approval. Andrew really carrying the mail here on this audio <laughs> <laughs> broadcast. <laughs> I got to ask Mid Gulp, how you doing? Fine, <laughs> <laughs> <Bye>, Brian. <laughs> um, yeah, man. No, it's uh, it's good to be back. Good to be back with everybody. I mean, yeah. not with Bryce. Bryce is still gone. Yeah, Bryce is still gone. Bryce is still gone. Uh, I never realized that the B, like. Like it, it almost works as like a BB. Yeah, like as one wide shot. Almost. Almost. You can see the different uh, color temperatures and contrast levels yeah. and stuff. That might be fun to kind of set up. I, I bet there's some function where you could blend the two and then make like a mega wide. <laughs> Probably good. That's That sounds like a Bryce job, though. Yeah, I know. It gets weird. <laughs> it does. Right. Well, Andrew, well, you Brian, stick your hand further out to like so the wrist goes past the 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 seam. There you go. Oh wait, you almost got it. You got the Doc, Mr. Fantastic thing oh, they, going on there. There you go. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> there dude. You go. I've never been. <laughs> I've never been so excited <laughs> to see three lines in the shape of the number four. <laughs> ah, Victor Von Doom, I'm coming for you. <laughs> There you go. Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. There we go. All right. Looks like I'm ready to go on this end. If, Andrew, you're ready to go on your end. Fantastic. All right. Andrew in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. It's me. And uh, oh, well, Bryce isn't here. No, he's not. Gone uh, uh, on his sabbatical yet again. I actually saw him on, on Friday, and uh, uh, we were doing a call-in show on, on Twitch, and, and somebody called in and, and was like, Bryce, I'll bet you that, you know, I know that you're a workaholic, and, and uh, uh, you're watching all these shows, like weird things, and you're thinking, man, I, I, I should be there, and, and Bryce hit him with a very swift, uh, no. I'm, I'm enjoying my I'm enjoying my time off, so we are well, we are very happy that he is uh, uh, resting and recharging, and he'll be back in a few weeks. Meanwhile, we're happy to have Mr. Corey Cranfield here. Yeah. So, yay! Yay me in your face, uh, real men whoever. don't leave if, uh, us <laughs> in our faces. <laughs> uh, yes, gentlemen, uh, we had some exciting. Uh, an event over the weekend that was the splashdown of the NASA crew uh, mission, which was actually, this was the return. Remember, we had two missions this year where we saw astronauts on board SpaceX spacecraft to go to the National Space Station. The first one was actually a SpaceX mission with NASA astronauts on it. The second one was actually the one that NASA, basically the NASA mission, so this was the first NASA, I think, technically like NASA mission that came back. And it was the first splashdown at night since 1968. Wow. Wait, uh, full stop for the world or, or for NASA? Uh, for NASA, and I think we're the only ones that have been landing people in water. So it would be both cases. Wow. Wow, how does everybody else? Bonker. Nobody else trucks them in the water? No, no, no. Everyone, everyone no. else just has them hit the ground very hard in Kazakhstan. <laughs> Like it's real, yeah. yeah. Oh, what? yeah, the, uh, oh, for real. Yeah, for reals, for yeah, real. Everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody, just yeah, just wow. braces for impact, and why then do, has why a do hard we have landing. the monopoly on that? That seems like just a smart idea, and <laughs> and, and water is free. That's God's water. Well, I mean, well, uh, 
Yeah. It's it's debatable over which is the better procedure. And you know, the Russians have been using it for years. They've been doing that. Of course, they also would give their cosmonauts guns to use because of wolves in case they landed in some part they couldn't Sensible. get to quickly. And that's I I, I yeah. think I think I think we should give I mean, look, uh uh just because nobody's seen a sea wolf doesn't mean they don't exist. So I'm I'm just saying maybe we need more guns on our missions. They're called sharks, Brian. Called uh, sharks. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. We should give them a blunderbuss so they can defend what? themselves against the pirates. The, but the Boeing Starliner, though, when that finally goes, that will land on land. And that will be the first time that we've been using the Americans will have used a capsule that returns to land. Uh, well, I, I, we're not counting the shuttle. Or, or I guess a capsule. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I see. Yeah. And so yeah. What, what what's the difference with the Starliner? Like, uh, uh, is that going to land easier than than other things? Or does it have like a, a cushion bottom? Where, where, where's the part where America's better than the Ruskies? That's what we well, want to hear. Just different. Yeah. How are we doing the Bartman differently? Uh, we had chosen, we started doing water splashdowns, I think in part because the available sort of area in which we could be doing return trajectories, particularly from, let's say, like the moon, I think that increased kind of a wider availability. So we became experts at figuring out how to land in water. Yeah. Uh, when you're coming back down from the International Space Station, I think there's sort of a, a narrow sort of area in which you can you could return pretty close to Florida. But I think from like a lunar thing, I think that that may have been part of the issue. Uh, I could be totally mistaken on that, but I think we just decided it was it gave us a lot more area. Huh. Uh, uh, and, and so this mission that, that we uh, were just talking about the first time that we splashed down since, uh, uh, 68, uh, uh, but, but you said this was solely NASA. This wasn't SpaceX at all. Well, this first time was splashed down at night at night. Sorry. Sorry. At night. Yeah. 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 I, maybe, uh, maybe they figured out that night was uh, a time when fewer Trump flags would show up to drive circles around <laughs> the spacecraft as soon as it hit the water. Uh, it's. You know, having a lot of Florida boaters there certainly was, you know, yeah. it was a bit uh, of a circus. <laughs> well, and I, I on all parties, I mean, I, I on all parts involved, because it was one of those things, too, where the first time we've splashed down an American craft like in like our lifetime out at sea, when you have boat ownership, you're in this thing called the pandemic through the roof. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> what are you going to do with that boat? Yeah. Driving oh, around the, the, the returning spacecraft. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, th this last one, uh, uh, it, it was, you said solely NASA, not SpaceX involved at all. No, it was SpaceX, but basically the idea was like the NASA, the official NASA mission. The first one was a test gotcha, mission. Gotcha. 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 And this, okay. so this was the, the, like, this is the real deal. The official Although, NASA, uh, 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 mission. Yeah. It, it it's, mm. it's it, a fascinating, uh, place that SpaceX has kind of ingratiated itself as, as the, like you know, if not premier, then certainly the, the most buzzy NASA, uh, you know, uh, company that it's working with. Third party affiliate. <laughs> well, uh, we, we've had, uh, you know, we, we talked about before that the, the lawsuits that came in place from first, it was uh, Dynetics and then Blue Origin or Blue Origin, then Dynetics because of the NASA had selected SpaceX to be the, uh, provide, landing on the moon services to the artemis program and the uh the other two bidders on that were upset so they both filed complaints and so nasa has put a temporary hold on that contract oh really i i i had heard mm -hmm. of the lawsuits but i had not heard of the nasa movement on it uh, uh this seems a bit odd because it, it by all uh, vectors spacex had a hilariously lower priced a uh, bid, right? So, I mean, they're not lawsuits. These are right now formal complaints. Yeah. So these are just complaints saying, oh, we 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 want this reconsidered, et cetera. So there's a lot at stake here for these companies because they've spent a considerable amount of money in the hopes of trying to get these contracts. And then all of a sudden, they NASA is like, hey, we only got $3 billion to spend, so we're going to spend it on SpaceX, which you go, well, that makes the most sense. Their argument is like, no, you should get more money. And meanwhile, you should provide development contracts to us. So it's this really, really sketchy sort of uh, 
contracting thing, which one of the things that drives me nuts because NASA will do developmental contracts to say, okay, we'll put, we'll give you 30, like they did. This started with funding to all these companies to develop bids and they came in with their bids. And now they're kind of like, well, you know, if you don't have the money to pay for our second provider or do this or whatever, instead of choosing anybody, you should just, you know, provide developmental money until, and this is what's been the, the pattern for the last 40 years from NASA and why it's spent so much money and doesn't anything to show for it so often. You look at how much money we've actually spent on manned space flight and it's, you know, without being able to see a single, the amount of money spent on man, manned space flight, not including what we've been paying for like, you know, trips on board the Soyuz since the eighties is probably 30, 40, 50, 40 billion dollars or more. And not seeing, putting a single person in space, and then here we have these companies like, well, you know, maybe maybe some money to help us, you know, you know, because you know, Dynetics is, you know, they're owned by Lado's company, which is a big defense contractor, which only makes twenty billion dollars a year, and <laughs> you know, Blue Origin, as you know, it's owned by you know just this retired bookseller, so yeah, they need help, a, a real, a real a, a artisanal rocket company. Well, and and so yeah. um uh when 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 you couch it as a complaint, which is actually what it is. I mean, they're, they're complaining. Um, then yeah, it sounds cheap, but it's like, if I think of it as a pitch and the most generous kind of steel man argument I could think of is the pitch is, Hey, NASA, you have a chance to, um, not go right back to your habit of only having one supplier for spacecraft. And maybe right now is a good time for you to invest in making sure that you have many people to choose from. So, so it's like in terms of a pitch, I get it, but well, but I think, unfortunately, the, the, the way it was described to me, and we did a great interview uh, with Anthony, Anthony Colangelo from the Main Engine Cutoff podcast on uh, PX3 a couple weeks ago, but he spelled it out that people were in general expecting NASA to take two bids because they traditionally take more than one bid for for things like this, but. NASA does not have the kind of money that they would need to take multiple bids right now. And what some were expecting, and I think Dianetics and, uh, or Dianetics and uh, uh, Blue Origin were expecting, is that even without having the money, they would still find a way to take multiple bids. Uh, and NASA did. They actually worked within their budget uh, uh, and said, hey, <laughs> this is what makes sense. We have faith in SpaceX. They are are they fit the the mold? We're actually going to do what we normally do, and pay for the thing that we have enough money to pay for, and that's where these other companies were like, like, whoa, 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 like, we didn't realize only picking one thing was was even on the menu. Like, we we always assumed that there would be two uh uh, uh two two of these pitches selected. So I don't know, man. It, it, that if anything. Going back to the same old song kind of sounds like what they are are going to be forced to do now if they indeed just wind up going back to the federal government and saying, I don't know, we were going to work within the money that was allocated for us, but these other companies are very upset with us, well, so we're going to need more money. If, if, if we're just game theorying our way through this, then I can see that it makes sense for them to fold their arms and say, oh, I guess you don't want multiple American providers of service to space. Mm, that's that's on you. You guys are real jerk faces. And uh, unless you want to change your mind right now, right now, I right mean, Because, by the way, uh, 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 Blue Origin is, is working with the United Launch Alliance. That was part of their... Uh, uh, well, they have a thing called the national team. The national team. Which does which, which include, included like a number number of other companies. Gotcha. I mean, but yeah, we, we're 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 looking at uh, a lot of underdogs here that, that desperately need this cash. A lot of multi billion dollar underdogs. Oh, so, poor guys. Yeah, the that I think Brian your assessment there too is right. Like the idea is like let's get them to uh, oh well you know go back to Congress get more money and that's always been a historic problem particularly because right now Congress is getting. The SLS program is getting so much more criticism now, and NASA asking for way more money to do a thing uh, is, I think it's bad timing for Dynetics and for uh, Blue Origin because I think that there's more attention now than before on how this money is spent. You can only take rah-rah space. Why do you hate space? We need to spend more money on space too far before people are like, 
let's add up how much we spent on things that never launched and went anywhere. And let's look at the best thing, the best value for a dollar. And if you read through the NASA report on why they selected SpaceX, I think they were kind of prepared for this because they made, they criticized, for instance, the Dynetics proposal saying that as it was, it would require negative mass to work. Oh. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> yeah. so like, uh, real quick, uh, uh, we fill it with helium and then we ignite the helium. <laughs> no, just helium and a very thin <laughs> shell and it floats right <laughs> on up uh, all the way to space. But if you have a way to ignite helium, we will listen to you, though. <laughs> um, but I, so I, 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 I will say that negative mass and ignite helium sound like drum and bass albums that I found in my friend's car in 1998. <laughs> So that was, there was, and their, their defense is like, well, no, because NASA had asked for some changes and we changed this, but this is, we can figure that out. And it's like, well, you know, you had this proposal and maybe, and there there are some instances where there were like some mistakes, like in the national team proposal too, like, cause they had asked for money up front, like we would need this money there, da, da, da. And then they're like, oh no, no, that wasn't. And sort of NASA's like, we asked for your best bid. Like, well, you, you know, you went to SpaceX and you know, you negotiated them like we, they said we negotiated them because they had the lowest bid, which we could afford. And then we said, could you take payment like installments? And they're like, yes. So I, I will see. I think that if if it, if the SpaceX HLS award gets voided, then NASA is forced to go back and try to figure out some strategy of which, you know, because the, the outcome is going to, you know, the question NASA can ask is like, OK, so if we give you each like a hundred million dollars right now, like uh, how much lower can you bring in this Blue Origin? How much lower can you bring this Dynex? You know, Blue Origin, which was like, uh, I think they were six billion, and Dynetics, I think was like twelve billion. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, and are you going to find a coupon? At, yeah, SpaceX was three. at three, right? So the, and yeah. that's and that's basically what. NASA's budget is so well, it's and, like and, oh, and it, it, it almost sounds like between the lines is just like well we need the money to develop the things so that we can get most of the way to having it for you and then ask you for some more money which is exactly <laughs> the business model that is that's the problem with the business model there's a a great book if you get a chance lift off by Eric Berger and Berger does a lot of great coverage of this he talks about how when early early days of SpaceX and like crazy stuff about how originally they were going to be launching the Falcon 1 from Edwards Air Force Base in California and then once they realized SpaceX was serious and may actually get a rocket off the ground uh one that would be a threat to their national launch providers and see you know, their intelligence launch providers two the idea that the rocket may be blowing up at Edwards Air Force Base could be a problem they started slow walking everything for SpaceX so SpaceX could not get permission or date when they could launch something so that's why they had to go out to the middle of the Pacific to this tiny little uh, island controlled by the army, but you see all the sort of politics of this in there. But one point, there's a meeting at SpaceX where some former like Lockheed guys are like, "Well, this isn't how we do things at Lockheed." Lockheed and Elon's is like, "This is SpaceX. <laughs> this is not Lockheed." If I yeah. do that one more time, and you know, the criticism sort of brought against Blue Origin is, you know, Jeff Bezos wanted to get to space, and he hired a bunch of these former execs who worked at these other companies, and they created a very well-funded traditional aerospace company that's giving predictable traditional aerospace results. You know, Berger talks about being on a tour at Blue Origin and Bezos says, you know, it takes six years to develop a rocket engine. Uh, SpaceX was in orbit in under six years. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, so, boy. I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful this is a new way of thinking. I'm hopeful that... Uh, well, just one side note too. Dynetics, in their criticism, they they point out they say you know choosing SpaceX is a bad choice. Of paraphrasing this, you know, as has been seen from the three failures of Starship, which have blown up, which you know have destroyed, which shows a lack of engineering knowledge. Bad. Like, oof. Oh no. Bad. Oh. Bad <laughs> politics. That that you shouldn't have done that. That was bad. Yeah, I was like, dudes, like. There is a case there for you to sound like, you know, you're making a sober thing, but this mean girl's like, well, they blow up their prototype. So what do they know about it? And like, oh, great. Hey, uh, Dynetics, show us your launch ground where you're testing your fully reusable craft. I want to see this because clearly you're the experts on engineering well, now. Also, so. I, I, I wonder whether, you know, some of that kind of commentary does seem beyond the kind of like technical capacity and more into sort of a popular argument 
like that 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 these are famous things so you're you're talking to people that are i mean i guess uh, uh not only nasa administrators which are very technically literate but also the politicians that are pulling the strings and the public at large which is kind of crazy that that uh, a, a a contract like this would be uh being fought about in the public sphere like that because that, yeah. that, 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 yeah. that, that, that is, that's not an argument that works here, and we're not professionals in this field, right? Like, like, like the three of us are like, oh, no, it's better that this private company is privately testing these things, and they are doing these engineering and feats we, that we've full, never seen with before. With full transparency, full allowing transparency. everybody to see how it goes, yeah. Like, 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 we're like, oh, yeah, that's good. It's cool that, that they get to blow these things up, and, and we see where we go from there. Uh, so I, 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 I don't even know who the audience is for that. And I, well, I'll, here's the thing to think about collectively three, each individually, individually, we know more than any single member of Congress about our space program and the capabilities. Yeah. That is a fact. That is just it, people out here like, no, hear like, that Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> trust me. Uh, there is, and that's that's kind of scary because they've been so that argument may be made. So, so you know, Senator What's His Face from you know What's Itville can say, "Well, I understand SpaceX is blowing up three of them spacecraft, you know." And yeah. but it, it's it, it's hard because they're making that argument about the experimental craft. Meanwhile, astronauts return from the National Space Station on board SpaceX spacecraft. So uh, I, I, I uh, help me decide who I'm rooting for in this scenario, because I do like the idea of multiple competitors. I don't like the idea of giant, fat, governmental, you know, garbage fire uh, wastage of money. Um, uh, on the one hand, SpaceX, uh, uh, SpaceX is very well positioned. They have a track record. They are the first mover advantage. They're very, uh, uh, affordable, efficient. Uh, they have an incredible track record. They're the obvious choice, but also something makes me a little bit squirrely about just picking one winner and sticking with them. What we root for is change. We're rooting for, there are brilliant engineers that are these other companies and they're very capable people, but they're all extremely risk averse. And, you know, part of risk averse, and they will sometimes those companies will spend some of their money to do developmental stuff. Sometimes they won't. We're rooting for a change where you know a company like Blue Origin can say, you know what, like let's go put the new Glenn out on the launch pad. You know, let's go try to launch new Glenn, and if it blows up, you know, fine, because we're going to build another ones. We're building our own capacity to do this. We want to get it right. We want to do faster. We want to iterate because we've seen. The SpaceX model has been get things onto the launch pad as fa you know faster to find out what's broken than try to imagine what could be broken and find out you don't know and things get delayed forever because that was the old model. The old model was you don't want to put this thing on a launch pad and have it blow up because also the way they're you know part of their whole line of producing things makes everything so expensive. But the idea is like let's make sure we're, we're pretty sure it's safe, but let's go test this stuff and then refine it and lower the cost of testing. It's, you know, do more science with real things. If that, if other companies start thinking that way and they start lowering their costs, it would be great. So I root for them changing their approach towards stuff and getting out of that old model, you know, that, well, we just really want money. Like some of these companies, I worked with a company years ago where like, it was literally like, hey, we want to pitch a proposal to the Pentagon because we know, you know, one of the defense agency budgets because, like, we think we can get a grant to do this, whatever. Like, what will we do? Like, oh, well, then we'll get another grant to go do this. And we'll do another. And I'm like, will anybody ever use this? Like, maybe. They're like, maybe somebody will. <laughs> I'm like, so nobody's going to really use this. So, like, this is just really, you just know, and so much of that goes on. Uh, well, we're rooting for you. To support us at patreon.com slash weird thing. Now, I've been thinking about this business model. Yeah. In this business model, mm -hmm. the patrons, they yes. give us money. Yes. And they allow us to develop our product. Uh-huh. And if it's good, yes. then we could get them to give us more money because the product has gotten better. And eventually, it'll get so good, yep. they'll give us even more money. Still more money. Right. Now, every once in a while, we have to put in a delay in the product just to oh, make them want it like we did when we didn't do an episode last week. Oh, yeah, but yeah. 
you will only get charged whenever we actually go to work and do a show. Let's put a pin in that idea. We can come back to that <laughs> later on. I'm not entirely married to it, but the, but I do like that. Go on about the part where they give us money. See, uh, patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, kick in some cash. Make sure that we are doing this show each and every week. And by the way, no matter what Brian says, it is for real. If we don't do an episode, you don't get charged. That is the Weird Things Promise. Head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash Weird Things. Get your custom RSS feed. Enter it into the podcatcher of your choice. And get early access to After Things, the show we do after Weird Things, wherein we talk about all kinds of entrepreneurial and experiential lessons. Patreon.com slash Weird Things. So I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, what, what's our take on... Um, what's our take on... UFOs. I mean, I'm for them. I, I was about I'm to say, I was like, I, 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 don't, I don't know that we get a vig on UFOs, but I would love, I want to be part of the action here. I, I'm for them on every level. I'm for them on the literal definition of unidentified flying objects where we just don't know what that glimmer in the sky is, or we know we cannot identify what that glimmer in the sky is. Weird stuff in the sky. Don't I'm, know what it is. I'm Anytime for- a military pilot says the words, what the hell is that? Uh, Kachinga UFO. Yeah, I'm here for big, gleaming 50s flying saucers, big heads, dark almond eyes, cigar rockets, circular rockets, All flying airplanes that are being mistaken for rockets, intergalactic whirly birds. I'm, I'm here for each and every one of them. Planets that people just forget are there. Boom. Why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> That's our pitch. Please give us money for UFOs. Uh, I want to pause the broadcast just for a second. I'm getting a ton of clipping, and I don't know if it's because I asked for the audio to be boosted, but and I don't know if it's making it into the final recording or not, but it uh, may it, be very it problematic. Sound, it sounds good. Brian's the, audio, the, the, is the, it both of our audios or just Brian's? It sounds like both of our both uh, of yours, actually. There's, there's, uh, there's two separate buses. One is being fed to you. The other is being fed to OBS uh, that's transmitting. So everyone at home seems to say we sound fine. Um uh, awesome. But it, it could be that we're blasting to the Skype bus uh, uh, out there too much. Um, so too okay, cool. As long as I'm the only one who's a victim of this. Yes. Oh um, well, no, no, we can we can fine. see if we can get it right, so we can. Uh, no, 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 uh, I don't preserve, care. I, no, uh, I'm I'm all I was worried about was the recording. That's all I care about right yeah. now. Yeah. Oh, well, I want, I want. So I don't want to didn't mean to derail things. I just want to make sure that we oh, were it's, it's smart, good. Hard UFOs, soft UFOs. <laughs> Fly UFOs. Classic UFOs. (laughs) Future UFOs. Cool. All right. All right. Uh, Here, I'll I'll, I'll start start here. Uh, Why do you ask, Andrew? The New Yorker has an article that just came out a couple days ago called How the Pentagon Started Taking UFOs Seriously by Gideon Lewis Krauss. And it is a very interesting read because you may have noticed there have been more conversations about ufos and footage showing uh strange objects on military systems etc and it's you know a topic that you know here we are in 2021 still talking about ufos uh, so, um, well well and and, cer- and, certainly uh and, and by the way ufos is such a delightfully uh, rorschach loaded term it's like yeah. if you want it to mean space aliens it can mean space aliens if you want it to mean weather balloons it can mean weather balloons if you want it to mean uh, the Ruskies invading us. It can mean that it's like, uh, yeah, dude, we should definitely be paying a lot of attention to stuff in the sky that we don't understand. Uh, also, I would like so, to dir- direct people to, there was a great, uh, episode by Andrew Heaton on his uh, podcast, the political orphanage, where he talked about UFOs and basically charted back a lot of the modern boom of, uh, uh UFO news coverage to like three people. That 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 this has has largely been kind of ginned up beyond the the actual recognition of of, of what the facts are, but based on like three people's now, commentary. Now, now, when you say recent, the the last time I was paying attention was like I know there was a big uh, moment uh, at the end of the Cold War in the '90s where they just released a bunch of uh, of, of of previously classified information, and yes, the Air Force in the uh, uh, over the last fifty years did a lot of weird stuff. 
just to see what would happen. Throwing throwing dummy bodies out of planes to see whether it looks like they would survive or not or whatever. Uh, but but you're saying even more recent no, than there, that. Yeah, this is more in the uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, where there was a video where pilots were, were saying that they saw a thing that seemed to kind of move beyond the laws of physics. I, I don't remember everything offhand, but but I do know that between those that commentary and that video specifically and then what happened last year where the government discussed a bunch of actual unidentified flying objects that that they you know just just kind of put out there uh, uh that that has so, kind of defined it but but andrew seems to know more about it with this with this article i know nothing uh well i want to be people are trying to correct me like no it's unidentified aerial phenomenon now yeah ufo it's the same it means the same thing yeah. and actually <laughs> if we want to have a better more precise term what we're seeing lately is uh weird stuff on instrumentation that nobody understands yeah um and so it's i let me clear clear up. i don't know i have i have no horse six-legged alien or whatever in this don't know all i know is that when we keep getting the same problems we had with previous UFO sightings is we get certain things that are people say are very specific. And then it turns out that it may later on be, well, we weren't certain about this. They'll say, oh, like these, you know, these people saw this thing that's 300 meters across. How do they know it was 300 meters across? Judging estimates in the sky, really hard. And we'd see these you know, radar displays and others and like, oh, this thing was moving this fast. Well, if you don't know how big it is, you don't know how far away it is, you really don't know how fast it's moving, you don't even know if it's you know something closer to it or whatever. And so we have the same problems with these things, plus people looking at you know looking at infrared images and other stuff that are very difficult to comprehend as they are. Some of these systems turns out were newer systems, things like this. I'm not saying these things aren't. I can't say that, but I can say that. We hear a lot of certainty, and when you try to drill down for details, you go like, well, how did you know it was 40 feet across? What was my estimate? Like, ah, you know, <laughs> that that could be, you know, there might be a mistake there. Well, and and uh, one of the, my favorite examples is of uh, how difficult it is to have a frame of reference. Um, uh, there's a bunch of mystery gravity locations, uh, especially like in the Pacific Northwest, where there's been partial landslides and all of the trees have kind of tilted at a 30 degree cant or whatever. And so as a result, because visually you, you uh, consciously or unconsciously use them as a frame of reference. Um, now they you don't recognize that they're all tilted. So as yeah. a result, it looks like waters, you know, rolling uphill or what have you. And you call it a gravity, gravity anomaly. Uh, likewise, you can have a still object, uh, let's say uh, Saturn or Jupiter or whatever, but you're looking up through this tree dappled area, then those trees become your frame of reference. And when all the trees very gently sway to and fro in the breeze, it looks like it's Jupiter that's that's moving all around in crazy, un, unpredictable ways. So uh, uh, so I, I, I agree, like uh, the last person I'll trust is me when it comes to <laughs> seeing anything up in the sky and trying to figure out how big or how far it is. You know, I remember one really it was a fascinating description. It was like uh, some pilot saw what looked like some boiling surface in the ocean, this you know weird sort of thing in the earth, some, some sort of phenomenon there, and then a whirling kind of pool, and they saw this white thing emerge, this sort of oblong, sort of flattish, roundish object emerge and fly straight up into the sky. And they're like, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. And they're like, and being like, how do you explain? Like, well, how do you explain? Like, I don't know. And then somebody's like, uh, yeah, that sounds exactly like a balloon released by naval submarines, which they use to do like for radio signals and weather testing. Right. And I'm like, oh, that's a real thing. That's a thing that's it for real. Like, oh, yeah, that was I remember like they're like, oh, like these formations like, no, those are actual naval flares. You can go to the company and see the ones that sell those flare or, you know, aerial flares. And, like some of these things you go like, I don't know. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, that's just this. I'm like, well, that's I'm like a lot of these might be just these things well so. and, and and again it's like uh i remember one of the most powerful ufo videos i had seen was a series of lights just showing up in the sky in this perfect line over the mountains and it's like i don't know what's happening or why and uh keep in mind the military in general is in the business of not bothering to answer your questions right so when later the military eventually said yeah, we dropped a bunch of flares. They're on parachutes. And they're like, why? Yeah. They're like, because we have to practice that in case we go to war. And yeah. it's like, 
okay, but that's weird. They're like, yeah, we don't really care how weird you think our, our exercises our, yeah, our, are. Our, our job is not to communicate with you. Right, our right, job is right. to protect you. In right. fact, communicating with you on any level is <laughs> detrimental to your own protection. <laughs> so we're just not going to do it. Cool. Talk to you when you send the next FOIA. Right. And there's, and there can be one, you know, one part of the military not know another part of the military is doing, and there could be, and they're also, you know, I'm not going to rule out other kinds of phenomenon. But the problem I had, you know, for years when I worked with, you know, full time investigating these things, when they drilled in the details, what people told you would happen, to evil witnesses told you versus what you could actually verify, changed a lot, and sometimes subtly, but you would hear. And I think the article goes into a little bit talking about how something goes, and Michael Shermer did a breakdown of this, talking about how something becomes, you're told concretely, it was this. And then you go, well, no, somebody said, I think it could have been 50 feet across. But then by the time the enthusiast like, no, it was 50 feet across with authority, like, oh, no, this was this. And it's like, I don't trust the people who are most excited about this. I certainly don't trust our government when it comes to telling me what's going on. So I kind of don't trust anybody, but the people who are, the ones were like, no, oh, you're going to explain this as, you know, birds or this like this. Ha, 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 you idiot. Don't you know? It's And uh, the funny thing in there is like they talk about, was it uh, uh, Blink-182, Tom DeLong? Uh, Tom DeLong, uh, who, 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 yeah. who, who, by the way, is one of the orchestrators, spoiler alert for that Andrew Heaton episode, but uh, uh, one of the one of the main orchestrators of our modern uh, uh, UFO uh, 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 popularization. Flap. Is, yeah. is what they call it. It's uh, Tom it, DeLong of, of, of Blink-182. No kidding. Angels and Airwaves, yeah. Well, because he was part of this group that that wanted to try the Academy of the Stars, whatever kind of thing, which was like this group like, hey, we have really conclusive evidence. And they had some, you know, very interesting looking infrared and radar images stuff that, you know, uh, I would be hard pressed to try to explain this. But what's sort of funny is that, you know, you have these people working together to sort of promote this. And then... Uh, you know, you know, quote here is uh, Keen uh, was, you know, person who'd been looking into this. She'd been writing about this because she wanted to take this thing kind of seriously. Soon developed doubts about DeLong after he appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast to discuss his belief that what crashed at Roswell was a reverse engineered UFO built in Argentina by fugitive Nazi scientists. I mean, that's, so like, that's, that's a fun story. Yeah, it seems a little bit more than all the small things. Uh, it, the the uh, 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 well, and and that's the uh, again, it's like the skeptic and the believer both see the same phenomenon. The skeptic shrugs and says, "Yeah, that's really weird," and then the believer is like, "Well, I mean, we can't just leave it there. We got it. We got to close this loop." And the skeptic's like, "Yeah, I don't know if we do. I I think we could just say." Very weird. Yeah. Someday we yeah. might know what I'm that was. I'm sure we'll work that <laughs> self out. That'll work itself out eventually. Yeah, but for now, just put it in the very weird category. Yeah. And uh, in defense of the believers, some skeptics are more cynics or just too quick to. And that drove me nuts because, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember a case where there was a, uh, uh, it was an, you know, one of the a popular YouTube debunker, and they were showing a, video from like a gas station showing these little things flying around or whatever. And I think they're calling them like, well, they're like, oh, they're fireflies or this or 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 why were they this color or whatever? And they're confidently it's because of this. And I'm like, I'm like, no, it's an it's it's an infrared sensor. It's an infrared light. That's why it's doing this. And I remember seeing these explanations that were kind of directionally accurate, but told with you know the authority of like this is what it is. And I'm like, no, this isn't what it is. And I would see that from time to time because I'd be working with skeptics who were like, they had to have an answer. And I'm like, one, we don't have to have an answer. Yeah. We don't have to explain it. Like as Brian says, we don't have to. We can go, yeah. I don't know, I, but you know, maybe more more data, we could figure it out. And that's, I think that was one of the dangers of, of skepticism was, well, I got to tell them something. Yeah. I, I Or else the dumbs will run wild. <laughs> I, I had to sit with that uncomfortable not knowing uh, for, for a very minor mystery. Uh, like uh, we installed a bunch of these ring cameras and uh, all of a sudden I get a motion alert in the middle of the night. And what I see is um, uh, uh, six glowing lights in an array that that bob up and down and then swoop right up to the camera and then separate and then vanish. And I yeah. watched it uh, like a hundred times. And then I, uh, it wasn't until 
like months of looking on the uh, the Ring subreddit that somebody said, oh yeah, 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 every so often a spider web will spin across. And because there are six infrared lights that are on at all times, the thin gossamer thread will oh. reflect it back. Sometimes the wind will blow these gossamer threads around and you'll get crazy lights. That's and it's like, that's insane. But, but it's like, okay, imagine that, that brief discomfort between when I described and then getting the answer. No, because I remember imagine we, did that this, we did this on Night months. Attack. Yeah, totally. where, where you, we, yeah. We, were, we were theorizing, oh, maybe it's something on the road. It, it, was, it was somebody driving. Because it's uh, it silkworms like, or, or some, kind wow, of, some kind of spider web that's stuff. That's rad. Yeah. So uh, in the chat, Ilink says, skeptics and believers should not be part of the conversation. It should be between observers and scientists, comma, military. Well, I mean, I think that... We're, I mean, uh, uh, spoiler alert, there are believers and skeptics in scientists and the military <laughs> and between observers. It's like uh, you could be uh, 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 both a specific gender and also a specific uh, race. Like, like the, the two have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Why would you just, dis- and, and again, I think that that might be kind of the prejudicial phrasing of skeptic. And I'd be queer. It's like, why, why do you want to block somebody who says, well, I want to look at evidence and science, all scientists in theory are skeptics. That is the basis of yeah. scientists, scientists, science is I need proof, you know, in order to understand how the world works, we need things that are falsifiable and a skeptic, the, some of the best, a lot of your skeptics are people who were brought in by the military. The people I know who do the best analysis by stuff are people who get consulted with because they get brought in to do that. And well, and, and, and the problem, of course, is that they're brought in for quote unquote answers. And it's like, yeah, uh, no, like uh, uh, if your answer is that's weird, <laughs> then then you might have people upset with you. Yeah, uh, I you know, I, how do we get to, yeah. And, and scientism is the problem of world because somebody who's a scientist says this is so then that's so, and that's, that's bad science. And you, if you were a party to half the conversations Justin and I have ever had over the last year, it is railing against this. Well, there are scientists. And so therefore we must accept it. It's like, no, it's evidence. Doesn't yeah. matter if you're a scientist or a mechanic, it's the same thing. And it is a frustrating, frustrating thing, particularly too, is, Scientists are generally very good within their own area of expertise, but often have little idea how how la- how unprepared they are for things that even fall just within a few degrees away from there. And that's that is a frustrating thing because sometimes a an astronomer talking to you about UFOs may be no better informed than a car mechanic who's been studying this for years because it's completely different. It's a completely unrelated thing. You know, do you want to talk to, if you want to go look at this footage to figure out what's going on there, are you going to go talk to a physicist or maybe somebody who worked for one of the contractors that designed that radar instrumentation, you know, well, and, and, them and in, likewise, you know? uh, we all have our own lenses through which we see the world. Uh, there was, I want to say four or five years ago, uh, over Scandinavia, there was a glowing blue spiral that showed up and was just like like a like a, a space hypnotist was trying to freak people out. And uh, if you are somebody who st- studies astrobiology or whatever, you would say, "Oh, it looks like somebody tried to use an interdimensional portal or whatever." Uh, or, uh, but but if you were a, a a missile scientist, you would say. Yep, that's exactly what it looks like when a engine goes bad and a missile begins to spin around and ionizes in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and, and it's just one of those... Um, uh, uh, both of them have that same impulse to collapse that superposition and have an answer, but they're going to come up with very, very different answers. Yeah. I, we have, I, I think, I think the biggest, the biggest problem in terms of the, the, the scientism thing is just like the crowning of a new class of clerics and, and the concept of like, Oh, okay, well let's just rally around names. Let, 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 let let's rally around job titles on, on a level that kind of, I think undercuts what all of us here love about the concept of the scientific, uh, the scientific method is that no, it's, it's constant. It is, right. it is forever. We are never at the end. We are always reviewing the data. And in fact, we are not looking for the shortcut of just crowning a new cleric class. Years ago, uh, James Randi and I got invited to a press conference in Washington, D.C., being hosted by the American Physical Society, put on by Bob Park, who was a wonderful guy, physicist, spokesperson for the APS. 
uh, and invest, you know, a, a, a skeptic of a lot of these things. And the proposal was put forth to create kind of this team of scientists and people to kind of quickly act out and give opinions and stuff to sort of stamp out pseudoscience. It's sort of like, this, this is the group of experts we asked, and they said this. And this was a proposal from Bob, who I loved, and APS. And Randy and I just sat there with, like, in horror. We're like, you can't, you can't say these are the experts and the experts say this is BS. That, that's not how it should work because yeah. everything is separate. You have to look at things, and we can't just be this, well, the experts guys said this is fake, so that's good enough for me. And we're like, no, no, like this is not going to make people trust us. This is the you know a bad – and it frustrated APS because they invited us there for this, and they wanted us to be part of this. But it was yeah. like – our answer is like this is not how you do this. So, well, and, and not only that, but there's that backlash effect where it's like um, uh, let's say you get 19 out of 20 anomalies exactly correct – the one you get wrong becomes ammunition forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever for anyone who wants to tell any crazy story they want. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's hard for scientists to often say, I don't know. They don't like to, you know, reporter calls them up and ask them something they don't want to say. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the danger. That's how you get into that trap. Like you mentioned. Yeah. So, you know, a great example too, was uh, we had, in California, there was this weird phenomenon out over several years ago over the ocean where something strange, bright up light in the sky and nobody's quite sure what it was. And it turned out it was like, you know, the Navy had launched like a Trident missile, you know, a test or whatever. And I had a friend of mine is like, ah, well, are you sure? It sounds like a cover up kind of. I'm like, well, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And then a year later, SpaceX had did one did one of their night launches that created the same phenomenon, and nobody that was a time where all the people we showed the video, people freaking out over it. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, okay, so was that done to cover up for the other thing? Did they engineer? Some... Yeah, I mean, stole the alien technology. Where do you think they got it? Well, it's and that's the problem with this is that for some people, this is a religious belief. They yeah. really want to believe that this is we're seeing signs of this. And if you start questioning these things, then it makes them uncomfortable because you're telling them, no, I don't believe in your religion. Right. Uh, but, and I don't, like I said, I, none of us here has a problem. There could be aliens out there. None of us is like, no, can't be like, 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 oh, you know, and I have friends like my buddy, Paul Heineck, his, his father is Dr. J. Allen Heineck, the guy who did the blue book report. And I've talked to Paul at this, at you know at length about this sort of stuff and there's a lot of stuff that his, his dad didn't walk in as a believer and his dad walked away go there's just some stuff we can't explain that we can't explain we can't just you know just ignore it and i i think he's right about that and i've talked to you know i've talked to you know pilot who did escorts for sr-71 jets he's got great stories about stuff and he's convinced the stuff and i'm not going to say he's a liar yeah i just my experience i've been exposed to so much stuff of like we don't know what it is and then years later it goes click i'm like oh i'm Willing to believe they're sincere, but I'm also hesitant to go, aliens. <laughs> you know, um, so uh, good news, everybody. Remember how there was that Chinese launch of a rocket where it fell there, that Chinese school, and those kids got to get an upfront view of like spacecraft? Yes. Yeah. Why should Chinese school children have all the fun? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> We've got, so, hey, look, we're going to outcompete China. Joe Biden said it during his address. <laughs> so we, uh, hopefully, come on, USA. Nope, no, nope, no. Nope, we failed. Uh, you see, China just launched Thanks, the first Joe. module for a new space station that they're putting up there, which congratulations to China. That's a big effort. They actually, it's Part of like China, what they do often, they license designs from the Russians, and this was sort of a, a version of a Russian module, but they put this up there, which is a, a big step forward from which is to be complimented. They put it on the Long March uh, rocket, the Long March 5B, which they had a successful launch of this, which was great. The core stage of this, though, is an orbit is likely to make an uncontrolled reentry over the next few days or weeks. Um, now I'm going to guess that this is a large enough, what's a Medusa it, that it will survive reentry and land somewhere. It's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem is this, and this is, I don't want to bash China here. It's 2021. The idea of these un, unknown, uncontrolled reentries like this is so amateur 
So whatever, like, great, guys, you put a space station up there, but now you have this big piece of you know rocket that you did not figure out where it's going to land or be able to account for that, which clearly is a failure. Clearly, they're not as advanced, you know, as much as, you know, uh, you know, capable as they thought they were. And that's, you know, I'm going to bash them for that because that's just not good. Not yeah. good. Yeah. That's a that's 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 a that's a whoopsie doodle. That's a that is that is a problem. So so we have no idea where this thing's going to come down. Nope. Wow. Round rule and of round thumb, we go. Twenty to forty. Rule of thumb for how much will come is twenty to forty percent of the original dry mass. And again, we had we had Skylab. You know, we had our own Skylab reentry, which were like yeah, and, Mir. and you know we had. What's that? Oh, and Mir as well. You know, we 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 had a rough. Well, that wasn't idea. ours, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, uh, on the US, uh, yeah. So we had, but we had our yeah, like our Skylab in 1979 was like, it's 40 years ago. Like this is this is <laughs> it's, we we know a lot more now. You know, to be a space power, theory. I mean that that is uh, there's a non-zero chance that if this lands in a populated area in any country. It's like it's like war roulette. <laughs> you're just gonna spin that wheel, and you're like, uh, apparently Ghana. Apparently, we're now at war with Ghana. Well, nah, that, you know, that, that, they don't. I mean, it's never escalated like that. I mean, it's 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 you just look like an idiot, and it'll you know. be it'll be a a a. Well, I mean, I guess I when, think when, there, when, there's when, some number of casualties where all of a sudden it won't be. Oh no no no! You know. I, I think international incident. Yeah. Yes. I think like the idea of an international incident uh, is is possible, right? Uh, uh, the question then becomes, what and where are we are we are we talking about? I don't think it goes to war. I think that that, uh, uh, but certainly, I guess uh, maybe maybe like uh, the economic equivalent of like all of a sudden it's sanctions. It's it's uh, everyone at the UN wagging a finger. There's a lot of it's, fingers wagging. Yeah. It will yeah, send yeah. fingers a wagging, uh, uh, but. Whether or not it would escalate beyond that, who knows? I mean, I guess the question, I mean, the morbid question would be, where's the worst place it could possibly land? I mean, first of all, uh, Michael Bay answered that for us years ago. The White House? <laughs> no, no. New York City, right? Or the, uh, the opening scene of Armageddon? Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, no, I was thinking of Devlin and Emmerich. Like, uh, I'm like, I'm like, hey, look, the, the, the. The the intro to uh, or the the trailer for Independence Day didn't have oh the got World it got Trade it got Center it got it yeah yeah up. it's, it hits <laughs> it the, the Eiffel House. Tower yeah <laughs> they they just get finished uh, rebuilding uh, Notre Dame and then all of a sudden it gets <laughs> 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 oh damn it <laughs> that's so messed up <laughs> so they have a uh, there was the the Chinese last Chinese space station, by the way, reentered in 2018, and that was also a we don't know where it's gonna land. Um, so I mean, hey man, the, uh, the, roll, the, rolling the, 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 the dice works really good until it doesn't. I mean, because I mean, like 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 the vast majority, it, it's gonna land somewhere in the ocean, right? right? Right. Like like by by the numbers, if we're gonna roll that, you know, two hundred and million sided die, <laughs> right? So. In 1979, debris from NASA's Skylab fell to Western Australia. NASA advertised for claims with respect to damage caused by the debris, but no state-based claims were formally made under the liability convention. There were some claims regarding illegal dumping. The local shire of Esperance, which was where I was at when I did my Shark Week special, by the way, really, really great little town, issued NASA with a $400 Australian littering fine. <laughs> oh, that's adorable! <laughs> Worth it just for the joke. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. That's Which I, that was this is the town where I needed to go to the hardware store and I go up to this woman who I've never met before who's like the wife of the person who we're renting this for and I go hey do you know where I can get a taxi she's like oh no love you're not getting a taxi around here I never met this woman before here are the keys to my car you can go use this that's wonderful that's awesome like, I mean when you live on the moon you might as well like yeah, yeah, take whatever. the rover yeah. it's we only got the I'm one like, <laughs> cool and I get behind the wheel I'm like it's on the wrong side of the car <laughs> and I've never driven on this side of the street before. And so I drove to the hardware store and it was terrifying. God, that's man. awesome. You get there, you don't know what's a knife and what's not like, that's a <laughs> <laughs> is it a knife? Is it a spoon? I can't I, I tell. Don't I don't know. Do we have time for one more? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, let's do it fast. Brian, I, I loved your story about your camera looking in your backyard and seeing like these strange lights, which, uh, 
Like uh, it was like. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh no, no, no! It was it was great. It was super surreal. It was bizarre. Yeah, it's cool. That's great. It's a cute story, Brian. It's cute. Uh -oh. Wow. It's cute. Uh oh. I mean, it's cute. It's uh -oh. cool. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me mm -hmm. there are seven lights somewhere? <laughs> Brian, how about a dinosaur? Sorry? Uh, uh, are they made of light now? A what? A dinosaur. A dinosaur. A dinosaur. All right, hold on. Let's see. What is this headline? Florida woman says she spotted a baby dinosaur running through her front yard. Oh, yeah. Through yard. Through yard. Palm Coast, Florida. We're going to have to see this video. All right, video. let's see. We'll see the video. We'll we'll let the evidence wait, wait, speak for itself. Wait, before we play the video, can we get a map of Palm Coast, Florida? Let's get a map. I just want to see. Does this where, look like dinosaur territory? Whereabouts? Yeah. Where does this lay in the previous uh, migration patterns of dinosaurs through Florida? But could you have a research installation near there? Could you have? How close is it to uh, 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 Isla Bonita or whatever it is? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Isla Nublar. There you go. Ah, the it's definitely there, Florida. The Corey. Yeah, that tracks. That seems like dinosaur the satellite, territory. The satellite image. Satellite image. Hold, hold up. Uh, lower left. So this is Palm Coast, Florida. It it is on the east coast of Florida. Oh, wow. Is that north of Okeechobee? Uh, we you've got seems awfully occupied. Oh no! Look at all that grassland. Like, and go to the north there. There's something suspicious. We got the Florida Archaeological Arch Agricultural Museum. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a likely story. Yeah. yeah. Cover up. Guys, this is very, this is dinosaur territory. Yeah. I mean, look, Andrew and I have spent uh, many, many years uh, uh, understanding the wild environs of Florida. You guys went I, fully undercover. I don't feel like we can totally dismiss out of hand the claim that there was a baby dinosaur running through this woman's yard. Let's let the had, evidence speak for itself. I had two chupacabra sightings, by the way. I'll remind everybody of this. Yeah. Two. That's two more than I think anybody else here. That's that's true. Uh, all right. Let's see if this works. Oh. Uh, hold on. That definitely <laughs> looks like a velociraptor running through a backyard. <laughs> All right, all right, hold on. Let's just go around one or two words. What does this look like, starting with Andrew? Dog costume. Uh, uh, Brian? I, I was going to say Callie in a costume. I, I was going to say wiener dog. It looks like a wiener dog. It's, it's just scurrying its little dachshund feet as fast as it can. Hold up, hold up here. I mean, actually, to be honest, it looks like a, just a straight up peacock. Wow, it uh, does. It looks... Yeah, actually, when when now that the video is blown up a little bit, it does look like the feet are longer. Yeah, and I think like it... there's a leash. Is there a leash? Oh, oh yeah. A leash. Oh, yeah. No matter what it is, oh, it you is know what? That, maybe it's a dog with one of those. Um, as a matter of fact, you can see the reflection up top. It looks like one mm -hmm. of those cozy, keep you warm. Uh, outfits you'd put on a dog. Oh, like it's a little dog parka? Yeah. Oh. That's a dog in a dog parka, yo. I just want to point out the state of journalism. <laughs> 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 uh, this is going to go around the world because like a barely... I guess this is what the, the point of the story is, is that everybody watches the video and we do exactly what we're doing right now and right, we all right. take guesses as to what it is. Uh, yeah, well, I think we won. We got it right. It's definitely a dog <laughs> in a parka. Do we have any... There's nothing in the, in the article, right? No. 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 Wait, why would you do that? <laughs> that would just reduce the amount of advertisements that people. Yeah, I guess. Watch I guess it. if you answer it, then you and invalidate your headline, like you know, like woman mistakes dog for baby dinosaur. It's that like, is not well, I as, don't uh, need to click on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I. Uh, sad. I was really hoping that <laughs> that part of the Jurassic this Park gonna were, be the one. I was really expecting for it to look right into the camera and say, "Not the mama." <laughs> Oh, actually, <laughs> look at the camera you can and find say, this on YouTube I'm a too. clever girl <laughs> and go running away. Yeah. Um, 
it is uh yet it's interesting to read the, on the youtube comments of this of the different explanations for it of like uh it's an iguana with its head stuck in a container <laughs> oh actually uh yeah no i would expect that in florida yeah sure yeah if you go to the youtube version you can actually uh freeze frame it easier and see like what it looks like and you go early on you can certainly see what look like dog legs and whatnot but just a theory i mean it could be you know some sort of extinct lizard yeah uh, i'm my my, so, my 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 bed is on dog it has it has a dog a dog's runner's gait uh i didn't know like i knew florida had all kinds of different um, <laughs> i like the fact that Corey's just watching it and not showing it to the folks at home <laughs> he's Oops. completely forgotten his job <laughs> he's just <laughs> i forgot to hit the space bar button yeah i i was in a walking to my car and all of a sudden i saw this lizard just running across the parking lot right past me on two legs yeah. And you're like, huh, that don't seem normal. <laughs> and, and, you know, I had to, you know, I go home to go Wikipedia this stuff and look up, like, did I just see like a basilisk lizard? You know, like, is, did I just see that? Or was this like a copy from Jurassic Park? Each yeah. were possible in my mind. And it was, and they have since started to become more prevalent in parts of Florida. Wow. And that's one of those things where it was like, we've got iguanas there, which were not native. We've got basilisk lizards there. And, uh, and then that was my first time seeing a chupacabra, by the way. <laughs> and then my second time was I was walking to the park and I saw this strange reptilian screen creature on four legs is walking along, kind of looking like a little bit nasty and it's scurrying into the bushes. And I'm like, I think I may put show the video here. And I ran up close to get a photo of it. And it was a raccoon with mange. Oof. Not Man. a pretty creature. No, no. That's it. That's it. So. Or was it? Was it just the camouflaging ability of the chupacabra? Who do you know? Gentlemen, do you have any picks? Yeah, dude. I finally saw that Bob Odenkirk movie. Nobody. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's really great. I liked it a lot. It was great. That's one of those premises where if i just told you the premise and i would see you'd be like uh okay sounds a little liam neeson like and it's like bob odenkirk kirk you're like oh i'm in <laughs> yeah <laughs> and 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 spoiler alert uh uh if, if you don't know the rest of the cast don't learn it it only gets better the further you get into it uh uh whoever was the casting director for that movie Called in all the favors. Give him, give him a raise. Yep. Like I, 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 I don't know uh, uh, a a a a movie in recent memory where each time somebody showed up, I immediately recognized them and and was like, oh, that's great. Oh, <laughs> I love that they're the person that that has this role. Uh, uh, and and uh, a, a slight thing for eh, I won't even pepper anything else into it like but, if, uh, if you have the ability to go in blind i highly recommend the experience have you seen it yet andrew no i haven't no i okay. haven't all right then i won't i won't uh I, I won't i won't dare say the question that it that it dares any other movie to 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 answer but uh, uh go okay. see it it's great okay. uh you know what i i, I partner i want to i want to do a quick survey here yeah um Who's been vaccinated? Oh. I have. If, yeah. Corey yeah. has. I, I believe everybody on the team has. My wife yeah. has. Double, my... d double doses, everybody or Johnson? I went. Oh, I, I, I went full Johnson. But also yeah. I got the disease, so that's a double dose in my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. I, yeah, I got my first dose. I get my next one in like a week. Nice. Um, right on. And uh, I, I, I was thinking, I, maybe do we do the next episode? I know there's hesitancy out there, but I, I know we're also we're not the type to yell at people, you no. know, for 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 being hesitant. And so I think that might be a discussion we do next week. We can talk about that because I've I've this is weird sort of thing where it's like like I think everybody should be getting vaccinated, but then other people are like ah oh, these dumbs refusing. It. It's like well, 
here's the thing when you yell at people and you mislead it to the mislead them they kind of don't want to listen to you anymore uh, yeah right like where it's like number of times that somebody is like you're so dumb why don't you do the thing oh you're right i'm uh, now fully convinced thank you for that yeah, compelling argument yeah. uh yeah uh uh I, I did a big thing on this on the PX3 Extra this morning, but there was an exceptionally stupid article in uh, the New York Times today talking about how a scientific consensus has been reached that we will not reach herd immunity, uh, which I think was a very stupid article. And I think that our concept, our modern concept of uh, popularly how we discuss herd immunity is is really stupid because there's no actual number. It's something that that is far better understand after a a wave of something comes through and then you determine oh well here's where this contagion met this level of inoculation met this level of variance like we don't know it's something that's going to be understood after we are beyond this uh here's what's real if you look at vaccination rates in israel and you look in great britain which to this point has been probably our greatest comps in terms of them being ahead of us we're doing very well vaccination wise in america thus far 45 to 50% is where you see a material downturn in cases and deaths follow cases. Even the most, the lagging uh, uh, trailers of American vaccination statewide, which is Mississippi and Arkansas, they are in the high 20s. This is not, un this is not impossible. This is not anything that we are particularly far away from. If you are on the fence, I would greatly... Uh, uh, I would beseech you to talk to whatever medical professional for which you trust, uh, uh, search the information. If you have already gotten it, I would ask only that you have patience to help get us over this line because as a country, we're at 38%. We're not far away. If, if we continue even at the vaccination rates that we're at now, uh, we can very much we are very close to to hitting major milestones that will that will very much affect us going forward so uh uh don't be dicks we we <laughs> please for god's sakes and don't and don't and don't get bummed don't be out. dicks get the prick and and and, and don't get bummed out when we're, we're we're talking about these fantasy numbers of of herd of of, of, of herd immunity which nobody can tell you and people can take guesses right. as to what herd immunity is or will be for COVID-19. Nobody knows. We do know materially 45 to 50% vaccination by population greatly turns stuff downward. And we're seeing it now in some states that are approaching that as, as we speak, that's the reality on the ground. So there we go. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is one of these things where like the, the term herd immunity itself is also kind of shows you sort of the problem where herd immunity often, if you literally have a herd that are all in the same environment, in the same system, Getting X percent, you know, immunized means this. The problem we had early on was, you know, you had old people going to clinics and seeing doctors and maybe getting it there because yeah. they're exposed to people around. It. And that was one of the biggest problems. Still, one of the stories that's really not talked about is how one of the biggest vectors was probably hospitals. Yeah. Because uh, we don't, you know, in the middle of people trying to save lives and do this, we didn't want to throw like criticism there. But it is in trying to understand a thing, you have to think about vectors. But all of those people here in the U.S. are generally, for the most part, getting vaccinated and vaccinated. We've been doing a great job. I see elderly people without masks on, and I'm like, that's awesome. Like, I'm because I know that they're vaccinated and they're finally taking these masks off. And I think that's like a great thing when I see an elderly person walk around without a mask. I'm either like, awesome, or you know, you're living your life the way you want, whatever. So yeah. I think it's it's. I get I got the first shot of Moderna. I'm getting the second shot in a week. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've read the stuff. I'm not going to tell people like what I know or what I don't know. I would say I've been frustrated by, you know, the thing that happened to Johnson Johnson was actually kind of predictable because if you look at, there's a history of like adenoviruses and whatnot and blood clotting. This was a known thing, but I think they downplayed it because they didn't want to panic people. And then people realize like, oh, there's this correlation here. And it's like, yeah, that's been in the literature for 15 years, but people didn't tell you. And now it causes a bigger problem, which drives me nuts. It's these people, these, these health workers or the scientists trying to be social engineer. And I think it's backfired so much. But yeah. uh, we're all distrustful, cynical, skeptical people on this podcast. And we all, even and Brian, who already went through it, even we all went through and got vaccinated because we're like, you know what? I'm looking at these numbers. I think I like, 
I think I'm think I'm okay with this. Uh, yeah, number one, I feel totally safe doing it. I will also say, my God, do I want to do live shows again? I want to do live shows. I want to do meetups. I want, and, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make people feel comfortable to come out and and see stuff. Uh, uh, it matters a lot to me for my own totally selfish perspective uh, uh, beyond what I want for uh, uh, all of society. So uh, 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 all I would say, look, if you are a hard no on the vaccine, cool. I'm not talking to you. Uh, uh, and I don't mean that, that I, I, I'm, I, I'm saying get out of my house, but like, you know, just this is not for you. If you're on the fence, man, just read up whatever you need to do. Uh, 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 Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Send me an email and ask me any question you want uh, if, if, if uh, I move the needle on any level. So just Tyler Israel, you're saying don't estimate how dumb the public is. I disagree with you completely. And I think part of the problem is that we have people, science communicators and people who are really bad at their job. You bring up the point, if we kept nuclear, nuclear medic resonance imaging, people wouldn't be as comfortable getting MRIs. Why are people uncomfortable with the term nuclear? They used to love the term nuclear because large groups of scientists went against, you're trying to advocate against the use of nuclear power. And so we had massive campaigns to tell people how dangerous and bad this is. We get spread with bad information. This isn't coming from blue collar people. These are academics and other people who deal square, deal scare stories, things like this about Three Mile Island, whatever, who exaggerate like, you know, the danger of these things. I don't think sometimes people can organically come up with dumb ideas. But, you know, we went through a pandemic where the leading experts were telling me not to wear a mask. We're telling me not to wear a mask when clearly the data showed there was a high correlation between what happened with SARS, previous examples, and this. And so if I'm going to blame, I'm not going to blame people for being dumb. I'm going to blame our experts for being either incompetent or just so catastrophically, you know, just misjudging their ability to influence people. And I think some of the biggest damage was done by that. I think, I think I'm going to say this here again, it's my rant. I think hundreds of thousands of lives would have been saved if we wore masks when we should have, but our experts told us not to rant over. Yeah. Falcon and the winter soldier is my pick. Um, <laughs> Just because it's the only thing I've watched, I've been working on another thing, and so I haven't really seen a lot. But uh, 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 spoiler alert: I, I I also didn't like it, but I guess the new costume is cool. Yeah, it's it's. I'm glad that Sam is uh is the you know Captain America. I think that's cool. I'm glad he. Spoiler alert, Sam is now Captain America, in case you didn't know that in the Marvel movies where Captain America gave him the shield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah. yeah I, I liked where everything ended. I was confused with some of the character motivations. Uh, yeah. I, I was befuddled by some of the action set pieces in the finale. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, made hungry by the crawfish boil at the end. Uh, so the range of the, the, the range of emotions. But, but but the important thing is that the core conflict, you know, the bad guys, they wanted um, the bad guys wanted that thing that they wanted, which was. Well, and then the other because no, no, but they weren't the bad guys. It was the the other bad guys, the, the, the evil, terrorists that were evil. Terrorists. No, 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 because there was. Remember when they went out of their way in the entire series to make the global so, council I, I, dystopic mm, Orwellian? Who the, yeah. Can I just say something? Can I just? There's a story in there. Uh, <laughs> I wish they told it. No, <laughs> the, so I yes. So yeah. the I mean like the I'm just, the Isaiah Bradley. The, that name means something to you or does it? I'm like instead of two people in a room telling me this guy's story, let's spin an episode. Yes. Let's do this story. And that the, our villain, who was the least, who is probably the worst, one of the worst Marvel villains we've ever had, because just just literally we get, ah, oh, maybe I should do this, but that's my path I've taken. If we had her story, if we had her story from the blink, all this, I would have been more into this. Instead, we get like, well, this guy's angry because of this. Like, show me that story. I want to see this, you know? It, it, was, but, it wasn't no. like, a lot of the stuff there wasn't necessarily bad conceptually but there was so much stapled onto so much else and uh uh you know it, it i think it just paints everything into really poor writing decisions like having your mega competent hero 
literally be taken out of the action by being handed a phone so he can continue talking on the phone instead of doing his job. And then when he gets off the phone, he literally just slaps his head and goes, duh, I shouldn't have got on the phone. Like he's Joey from friends. Uh, oh God. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, it's just, it, oh. It, it's, it's, uh, really weird. And, uh, uh, I'm very, I will say this. I, I liked where they went with, uh, uh, I mean, I have other questions on exactly how some of this works, but I enjoyed the character that uh, uh, initially inherited Captain America's shield and then eventually ends up uh, uh, in the role of another character. I think he was a fairly compelling actor. I thought that that, that he uh, uh, did a serviceable job with a role that was like bafflingly all over the map uh, that ends with just being kind of like another one of the heroes at the end. Ah, oh, like, finally, I'm back to good military guy. Ta-da! So, do you know, you know who that is? Yeah, th- uh, that's uh, uh, Kurt Russell's son. I, I'm oh, watching is halfway yeah. through, I'm like, yes, I'm going, this guy looks like a young Kurt Russell, and his name's Wyatt Russell. Never did it connect in my head. <laughs> never, <laughs> never did I connect that until my girlfriend pointed out, like, yeah, it's, I'm like, well, obviously. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I thought I thought he was uh, I thought he was good. I'm curious where they they go with him. He was always one of my one of my favorite comic cards where he ends up uh, uh, without spoiling it. But yeah, yeah I, I actually liked I mean, because from the, the comic book history of the character, like I, I, I you kind of thought like a worse fate was going to happen to him. And but they made him more. He was probably the most nuanced character there because you understand his motivation at every single point. Yes. It, which is something that you can't say for any other people in that show. They, 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 they tried to tackle a lot. They, they took on a lot in only six episodes. They sure did. They loaded up. They went to the buffet, and they said, one of everything, please. And it's like, are you going to eat all that? They're like, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Maybe. I mean, it's just. Uh, anyway. Did yeah, like I get it. Uh, uh, I I think yeah for some of the elements they wanted to go out like I said like to, to do the story of what it means to be black and to be a superhero in America and do like a historic sort of thing from there today uh, what's changed what that has is, it that is all one on story Suits, that yeah. is one story that I think would have merited six full hours one story <laughs> yes. just a pitch yeah. for you how about we wedge seven other stories like uh, also resetting also bringing up the. Uh, the uh, mm, mm, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, Falcon and, and Winter Soldier. But there's a great speech at the get. There's an Aaron Sorkin level speech at the uh, end, though, guys. That's the thing. Yes, I could tell it was because I woke up and he was still talking. I mean, oh also, God. it's like, I, I love Homeboy. Stop, as, stop. Yeah, don't, no, don't, no, no, no. I'm just going to get me in trouble. Of all the Aaron Sorkin, I'm going to solve all the problem American president style speeches that you're going to make. There's one thing that even Aaron Sorkin never had the balls to do, which is make his protagonist give it in swimming goggles. <laughs> I uh, mean, but also to, to have the point be, you can't call them terrorists just because they use weapons and kill people to try to intimidate and scare you, well, terrorize, and, and, one and might they, say. And they literally tried to burn you alive in a van 20 minutes ago. <laughs> that doesn't make them terrorists. <laughs> I mean, and also at no point does anybody go like, uh, Cap, thank you so much, man. Can we take this offline? Can we Can we go, like, just not in front of everybody uh, uh, right now? I, I, uh, uh, there's so much that I like. I like all those actors. I, 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 and again, there are elements of this that I really did uh, uh, enjoy. Uh, but boy, and even when they staple on stuff that I like, like bringing in uh, uh, a, a, I don't know if, if it's Pao's secret. Good. Let me just load up. Uh, oh, noodles too. I'm sure I'll get to these. Yeah. Oh, I loved Veep. <laughs> Let me just add a little dollar. I, <laughs> I, I I love I love everybody involved, and I think every in, in the showrunner Spellman, all all extremely talented. I have a feeling this is kind of the Marvel machine at its suboptimum. Of what yeah. we need to have this and this and this. I mean, I, I will and, say they are they are one for one. I I adored Wandavision. I yeah. I Wandavision stands uh, 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 atop my favorite television shows that I have watched uh, uh, so far this year. 
but uh, be hey, ba, 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 was, <laughs> wasn't that wow, wow three spoiled white guys like the spoiled uh, white supremacist character the most uh we thought they spent the most time developing that character we wanted we wanted the isaiah bradley story we wanted to see more time wanted, on him I, that's what we wanted <laughs> i wanted one story uh yeah <laughs> not not the entire uh lick of sticks fun pack yeah, uh, but way to way to reframe that, you know, as we make our whole point, like, no, we want that other story about injustice. We want that story about this. You gave us a lot about this guy, which, you know, turned out to be kind of interesting because it's the only character they developed. Well, he also had Is an that arc. our fault. He had an arc he in a arc. way that, yeah. that uh, uh, even if it was a baffling one that, you know, he goes from, I guess, in, in show world time. Like a week and a half <laughs> from we, public international murder to like high fiving our and, heroes. And we get, uh, and we get, I'd say a Bradley poor guy. We just get him go, huh? Oh, I guess he has a point. Da, 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 da. I'm like, <laughs> that's all you're going to spend with that? Like, I, there's a great, great convert. Like, they were dealing some great themes there. They tinted at that should have been done. No, like, give me, like, give me, give me the like, you know, uh, there's been so much. I mean, obviously, look, we're kind of in a golden age for telling uh, uh, racial stories through the lens of science fiction. And uh, some of them are like things that I like better, like Lovecraft Country. Some of them are uh, a show that I won't name that's based off a comic book by Alan Moore. Um, but uh, I think this was something that like it, it needed more of that element. Like, I would have loved to see a longer version of the, the Tuskegee experiments plus super serum oh. stuff. Yeah. There are so many, there would be, it would be so many ways to bring like one of the great things. Like I was not like a big fan overall of the Watchmen TV series, but one of the things it did though, was it brought to light, Hey, there's this really dark chapter of American history that we don't talk about very much. Yeah. Let's talk about this instead of pretending things are okay. Like I, I'm, and I, even if I don't agree, I'm like, just tell me a good story. Like, yeah. You know, like, told, tell me a good story. It's also told better in Lovecraft Country. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so there we go. Uh, yeah. who, who had, go, uh, Andrew, you go. So my pick is, uh, things I don't understand, but man, it's kind of cool. Uh, Sabrine, Sabine Hassenfelder, who I've mentioned before, has a new video on YouTube out and she's a theoretical physicist and she talks about dark matter. And she'd been studying this for a long time, and she's come to the realization that perhaps the problem of trying to understand dark matter is that it may involve explanations from two competing theories. She's, I love, like, again, when somebody like this explains stuff to me, it might as well somebody explaining to me, like, you know, uh, the history of wizards in Lord of the Rings. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I like the story. I don't have any way to know if this is true or not or real, but that sounds good to me. And she brings up a really great point, though, and it, it just it's made it still resonated with me. She says that perhaps the wrong people in physics are studying this, where it should be the the uh, condensed matter physicists should be studying this instead of the people that are studying it right now. And that's a thing where we often sort of when we see this, what we've been doing over the last year, PhD in front of somebody or behind somebody's name, and we're like, oh, well, of course they know what they're talking about, but. People have different branches of, of, of things they look for and they're experts on. A big shift in – we went from chemists becoming physicists and then mathematicians becoming physicists for certain degrees. And then we ha started having things like string theory and stuff, which may be unprovable in our world, or provable maybe in a mathematical model, et cetera. But I love that idea of thinking like maybe the wrong person or the wrong expertise is using to solve the problem. So I recommend her video. Uh, it's titled Dark Matter, The Situation Has Changed. She's great. I mentioned before, PBS Space Time is also another one. That love those fantastic videos. They're just really, really good explainers. Awesome. Cool. Corey? Yes. Uh, my pick is F1 on Netflix. And have y'all seen the F1 series on Netflix? I've heard good things. No. Yeah, yeah. It's super good uh, documentary about um, basically the season in Formula One. So, you know... Even if you're not a fan of Formula One, it's just done so well and the story is crafted so well and they do so much good uh, work on the drama side of it. It's just an amazing series. It's it's really, really good. So you you, you don't need to be a gearhead. No, this not is, at this all. Is, this is like one of those like 30 for 30s that like even if you didn't care about sports, you you can't deny the the human drama and, and the fact that they got so much footage and, and, and good interviews. And yes, 100%. And, and there's obviously so much drama inside of the sports, especially in Formula One. 
you know, between all the drivers and everything. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy good. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It, it's amazing how much money is in that. Oh uh, yeah. All the money. Like, like I, the biggest, here, right? like the fanciest house yep. in LA. What's that? I was just saying that they have a big event, but like, yeah. Cir- minutes Circuit of the outside. Americas is here in Austin. Yeah, like there's like the one of the biggest houses in like Beverly Hills was like the daughter of the guy who like you know ran F1 it was just like insane. You just look at how much money, and it's one of these things that it, and you kind of go because most people don't pay attention to that or even NASCAR on average most, but enough people do or so into it. It's like you go to a NASCAR race and people having the headgear to listen into the cockpits and stuff, and oh, you look yeah. at how intense that interest is. It's amazing. So cool, gentlemen. It's been weird. I got bad. Yeah, me too. I have had to pee for a minute. (laughs) BRB. BRP. Fine. Me too. We have different graphics and stuff for the, the lower for the chat. Are you ready for some after things? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Andrew, are you ready? I am oh, just about ready. All right. Sweet. Just yell at me when you're ready. Brian, you are... Uh... You are you are you are doing everything you can. I've I've pressed all three buttons many times. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, I think that that's an time, old time time of death. Yeah, this time, old time to call it. I'm gonna mm. bury it in the yard. <laughs> can go live on a farm. 
Ugh. It's got me a bit preoccupied. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have a topic here? Uh, we had a question, which I don't know if I feel qualified to answer. Mm -hmm. That's from our, our friend who does the music tab stuff, and it's about copyright. <laughs> and oh, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, like, lawyer time. Um, I, I think we should talk about it, but uh, I was thinking... Do you want to do a pitch like 2021 ways to make money as a creative? Sure. Yeah. You know, I'll start off with a couple things and just say, Hey, are things to think about? Cause, uh, new, I think new the thing tools that we, and avenues. Yeah. Cause there's, you know, things have changed a lot. And, and I think that, uh, I think we take for granted, even though we even do a show called after things, how much we're already kind of attuned to a lot of this stuff. Yeah. In other words, we're conniving. Already working. Plus Buying our wares. Yeah. Then, uh, Corey will tell us what the hell's going on with Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Uh, cool. All right. You ready to roll? Yep. Yep. All right. Andrew in five, Four, three. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, Fred. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo ho. And Corey Cranville. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen. So what first a up, <laughs> <laughs> we have a question. And this is from one of our regulars who is, it's been amazing to watch what's been going on with his uh, business. And I'm going to paraphrase this down. Uh, so this is from, uh, this was forwarded to me by via Bryce, who's still alive, apparently somewhere, somewhere <laughs> in, I have this, like, I have a feeling that like he's in like Brian, you've got like a Scientology bunker and Bryce is being punished somewhere. I mean, uh, look, he made his own decisions, and he's going to sit thoughtfully until he decides to come back. No, look, you, you know, you know when in like like uh, shows you find a character and they're like in some like opium den in Tibet or something like that. That's Bryce, but with Taco Bell instead of opium. Like he's literally just sitting in the corner of a disheveled room with just chalupa wrappers on on Man, either I, side. I, now of you it. got me all hungry. What are you doing? <laughs> So uh, this is a question regarding, uh, so again, this is from uh, David, who has been doing these uh, really kind of cool, he teaches like, 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 kind of like, uh, like music tabs and stuff. I'm going to get my terminology completely wrong, because I am a complete idiot when it comes like, to music. Uh, guitar tablature, right? Yeah. Holy copyright canary, Batman. The last two years, I've seen incredible growth on Patreon. Just hit 6,000 followers, making educational guitar content, videos, YouTube, custom sheet music on Patreon. I just ran into my first DMCA headwinds, specifically for 20% of my song lessons. I took down the offending post and all is well again for now. My questions. Should I assume this is likely going to happen again and adjust my strategic course accordingly? Or might be wise to wait low and see uh, see so that I can preserve my growth engine. Um, he says, I've been in touch with the leading vendor in the sheet music publishing space who can happily license my song PDS, provided they're only sold in their online stores, which is downsides, DRM, lower commission, commission, but would be, but would allow me to be in a good graces of law and order my, and lower my risk. Given my goal is to go full-time next year, doing things by the book sounds hugely appealing, even if it means having to do the work to adjust my customer messaging, tweak my value proposition, pricing, et cetera. Curious your thoughts and uh, additional context below, but I think we could probably go from there. Um, so, if, if if I remember correctly, the the emailer's profession is by doing YouTube guitar tab tutorials, right? Or is he doing that? Yeah, and then yeah. and then his 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 product is go to my Patreon and you will get 
the the written out tabs. Yeah, I th- as much as I understand it. All I know is song right holders or agencies representing them are like, hey, this is violates our stuff. Take this down. And he's like, he do has. I lay low or do I work with a company that has the licensing to sell these things? Um, oh, he's in the chat right here. So Yes, video lessons are free. The PDFs are the premium offering via Patreon. And thus far, the things that got flagged were video lessons for roughly 20% of his offerings, which he pulled down. Uh, yeah, which, by the way, means uh, if you got a takedown, that just means you have to pull them from YouTube. It doesn't mean that you have to set fire to them and they vanish forever and ever. Um, the uh, here's, here's one thing I know is whether or not David can beat Goliath is a fine question, but I know that d- both parties bothered to show up. They didn't just hide and let Goliath like <laughs> they didn't just hope Goliath was going to go away. Like uh, uh, who's to say whether or not you'll get a powerful attorney on your side or a powerful agent on your side, but you need someone who is not you to who speaks this language because if you are gifted at uh, making YouTube videos and tablature arrangements, then by definition, you probably are not a gifted lawyer as well uh, or a gifted agent. And so you should get literally just anybody on your behalf to uh, to, to play ball and then find out what, oh, what you get. Wait a minute. He, so he's in the chat saying that it was 20% of his Patreon posts. Uh, so so the DMCA came in through Patreon. It wasn't an automatic thing on on YouTube. He says he left them on YouTube. Uh, so that is something that's interesting because I I I don't think that there is any uh, programmatic DMCA stuff on Patreon. I think that requires Patreon to actually get a DMCA thing and then they manually serve it to you. Man, that's bonkers. Yeah, um, Patreon sent it from the Musical Publishers Association of the USA. Okay. I mean, I wonder I wonder uh I wonder if you'd be any trouble. I guess the perception is is that you're selling sheet music that is uh of copyrighted materials like uh uh that somebody else owns. I wonder if you just quote unquote gave it away or or had a mystery bonus pack for anyone at a certain tier and then you just gave them, you know, all that stuff quote unquote for free. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think number one, uh, let's, let's, let's start here. None we are not the, lawyers. We don't know Jack <laughs> about, but on this one, this so, is why I'm like, saying, uh, uh, have, have a rep of some variety. Yeah. Just literally anyone do not trust yourself. Most certainly do not trust us three clowns. Yeah. So that being said, uh, if, this is coming. I initially thought that this was something that came to YouTube, which uh, you could presume happens for any number of reasons because of the the automatic flagging. Yeah, or automatic whatever. flagging. Yeah. If it came through Patreon, that means that you are on the radar of somebody that is is does not believe you are legally in the right to sell those PDFs, and they are going after the end of your uh, uh, monetization chain. My thought is if you have done part of this research, research, which it sounds like you have, and you found an avenue for which you can partner with somebody else and they can sell it and they have some carve out uh, uh, by whatever license they they have, either A, investigate why they have whatever blessing from the, the music uh, copyright gods and see whether or not you can be blessed in a similar manner, or B, just say, all right, I'm going to take less money and I'm going to adjust my value proposition. I'm going to uh, uh, leverage my YouTube uh, uh, celebrity to cash in on this other end. Uh, I would say instead of the Patreon or in addition to the Patreon, just tweak what you're giving people on Patreon. Um, I would speculate that you could also change your actual entire... Um, format into something that comes like don't forget uh you can get a private lesson for me private lessons are 30 minutes long i give you my full attention i answer your questions and then i give you everything i've ever done bye yeah private lessons are 100 bucks a piece hope you buy one yeah schedule it for whenever 
Yeah, I mean that's 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 certainly more time intensive. Uh, but you could also just do the back end of what Brian said and just like, hey, would you like everything I've ever done? Right, like, Wait, right. Well, it, it, it would. I, I guess I'm couching I guess, it as, I guess maybe as an extra gift or sure. whatever. Yeah, but I mean, maybe you can do a another a bonus video or Man, something. This, something, this something is all, scale. We're, just, we're just straight up giving legal advice. Let's <laughs> I mean, not we, give legal advice. Yeah, we are not lawyers. We can't. We can't. This is after this. we realize we shouldn't give legal advice things. So, uh, uh, yeah, don't call a lawyer that rocks. Yes, I alt is. Just do the legal path. Just the 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 problem with the lawyer path. A lawyer is going to tell you. Generally, a good lawyer will tell you do the legal thing, yeah. and then you're like, "Cool, buy thousand dollars." Yeah. And uh, versus if you're like, if you want to bring in a lawyer because you say you mentioned fair use, then like, then you got to say, "Okay, I'm going to have a lawyer on retainer and help me fight these fair fight these things because." They'll come at you. And I'm yes. not saying don't do that. But if you're like, you know what? My business model could probably work better. Like you could try the lay low. The problem is if they hit you hard and you wake up one day and you've been slammed. If and I would I would seriously investigate finding the legal, the most legal option to do that. Um, because like I said, all a lawyer can do is they can give you an opinion or they can help file a case for you or defend a case. Yeah. I three things. And and that's why I, I would take very seriously whatever avenue you found where you would be selling your work to somebody else that says that they have the the clearance to do it. Uh, but I would also investigate what their clearance is. Like like is there like an yeah. ASCAP license or something like that that they have that gives them the, the 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 right to do it? Is there some way that you know they work out royalties with uh, uh the 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 rights holders? I, I have no clue what that world is. Uh, I would I would say it is worthwhile for you to investigate. Yeah, I mean, I my point. If you're not gonna if if you just want to take the the legal path and do that, if you want to bring a lawyer, if there's you know, a link has a suggestion for a lawyer you can speak to to see if you can get an opinion. But I've gone to like I've had lawyers before about copyright stuff, and I've gotten advice before like, yeah, no, go do what you're gonna do. They will send you a cease and desist. That'll work in your favor in this case. Um, but when you're in actively, I guess I think the case is here. He's getting these cease and desist, he's getting these shutdown orders now. You know, you are a proactive, like it within my rights to go do this sort of thing. He's getting told, no, you've got to do this. So if he continues to do this, he will. Yes, he will need to he's, regain. He's, you know, want to retain a lawyer. He's know? also getting them through Patreon, which which yeah. is 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 a additional problem because Patreon can at a certain point say, hey, we've gotten too many of these. We're not here to harbor copyrighted the sale of copyrighted material we're going to cancel your account and we're not going to give you any recourse on how to get it back yeah yeah so it's like you do yeah if you want patreon to be a part of your monetization strategy for anything going forward you do have to be mindful of that because there is no recourse if they just say bye bye i would also download all of your email addresses like Immediately. Immediately. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I would also often. possibly create a golden platinum diamond elite club where they pay you directly over PayPal. Uh, and <laughs> what do they get? Uh, they get your warm wishes and access to your super secret inner tier email group. Uh, but yeah. Brian, you're not talking me out of the idea there's a bunker somewhere on your compound <laughs> with Bryce inside of it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I, look, uh, uh, stay on the right side of the law is number one. I think like if if if, uh, if 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 anything that we say resonates, then then you do not want to do anything that puts you on the other side of the law. Uh, now, oftentimes this part of the law is weird, and especially on the internet, exactly where that law reaches can oftentimes be fuzzy. But if you're getting what what worries me is that initially when Andrew read this, I thought it was to YouTube, and that happens all the time for right. a billion that's, different that's reasons. Automatically flagged and triggered, and and there are bots that that call yes. other bots on the phone, and it, they have it, their bot conversation, and they decide <laughs> screw humans. And if this came to if this came to Patreon, you are on a, a a a spreadsheet you do not want to be on, and it is a spreadsheet that will eventually you know that that's that's a far bigger problem you are on a you are on a much a radar you do not want to be on if they sent a thing to patreon so uh Ilink brings up a great point here substack and 
one of the things I want to talk a little about is I moved every, I moved my entire email list. I was paying, you know, 150 bucks a month, whatever, you know, and Brian, I know Brian laughs at me, but Brian, my email list is just to like, say hello, <laughs> you know, uh, and my email list is like, I use maybe I do like one email every couple of months or something. Um, I don't use that frequently, but MailChimp makes you pay a lot, even just to have your email on there. They have a pay as you go plan, but it gets more confusing. So I downloaded all of my email addresses and then I put them onto Substack and I pay zero a month and I get it have a email that works as a blog and works as an email and send things out and I could create other ones. So I created two new ones, one that's really focused just on writing another one that's on AI. I think that for me, I just want a different outlet to be able to reach people. But what I love about this and the advantage of Substack is pointed out by Link was that with Substack, you can have, download those email addresses anytime. If tomorrow Twitter decides to block your account, you got nothing. You know your your audience. You're completely disconnected from your audience, and Name that's what's happened. Name one forty fifth president of the United States that that <laughs> happened to. Fair point. I can't because <laughs> I forgot his name because it's been erased. Uh, apparently, can't even be on appear in a YouTube uh, Facebook video. Um, nothing scary here, folks. Everything's fine. So I think that we live in a you know a world where that's the power of companies can sort of say like, yeah, know what, uh, you're gone. And you're gone. But if you control email, that's harder to get rid of. So highly, highly recommend uh, everybody here, everybody here who has any inkling to do anything creative, whatever, go create a Substack account, create a free account to say, hey, this is going to be my, my cool stuff by me. Put the link in your Twitter. Put your link wherever you want. I put my links. I put two links right in my Twitter which was for the creative writing. The other one was for AI stuff, which maybe it's confusing to people, but I know every day I'm getting people signing up. And who knows what, you know, you might want to be able to do with that in the future. We just, we just listened to David who took his love of music and is turning this into like a real business, a real business that is able to scale. And these things are out there. There are a lot of new opportunities. We're watching journalists and people who cover different topics creating paid Substack email, you know, accounts that have accounts there where people pay to read their stuff. It's not going to be the answer for everybody, but there are way more ways to monetize stuff now than there ever were before. Uh, all my, my my top line about Substack is that it feels so much like the early blog meta. Like there are a lot of really interesting people putting a lot of time into the uh, uh, that that world. It, it is a UI that is simplistic in a way that like early Blogger and WordPress was simplistic uh, before. You know the the Squarespace kind of direction kind of took it into more of a like oh and also you can sell things and also you can host a podcast and also you can do X Y and Z. This is purely writing focused. It does a lot of things that I think. Uh, uh, certain other uh, platforms probably should have gotten better at, including expanding tweets automatically to embeds and expanding uh, uh, pictures and making them very easy drag and drop. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the 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 viability of it, I think, I mean, it it makes sense. It makes sense on a level that uh, uh, a lot of online ideas don't make sense in that it kind of has the underwear gnomes of uh, business model of like, you know, get a bunch of people profit. Uh, Substack is pretty simple. It's like for the price of what they have to send out the emails, they've got X amount of people that are going to generate revenue and they take their cut on it. And that's, that's what it is. They handle the the, the processing and, and they are the place where, where it is hosted. Uh, so is, is there a, is there a limit on how many on the free tier of how many emails you can import? Nope. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, how good are they at getting past the spam filters and stuff? Uh, I, I, I get the exact same open rate on Substack as I did on MailChimp. Now, hmm. I don't know. I mean, uh, my open rates fairly high like it's in the the, the 40s to the 50s mm -hmm. um but then again i'm doing a a pure content play uh you know when i i did one blast for my covid shots equal body shots uh t-shirt that we put out and that was 
you know, in the 25 or 30 range or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it, it seems to me to be an identical experience, at least by the metrics that they are giving me compared to what uh, uh, MailChimp gave me. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's great for e-commerce. I, I think that there that's, are a lot that's of... That's the part that I suspect, like, they'll... they'll mm-hmm. I suspect that they will not go to bat for me the way MailChimp will. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I think MailChimp also offers a lot of bells and whistles in terms of A-B testing and staggered, like, releases and stuff like that, where I think uh, uh, it is optimized for a store in in a way that you use your, uh, your, your, your mailing list. But if you're just doing... A newsletter content, content yeah like and that's really what it they're they're the, they went out and didn't go get adidas and supreme and and all these other like brands that use e-commerce they went out and got journalists uh and they wound up getting them at a discount because uh they had been canceled right right <laughs> so like they were able to go and say hey here's they didn't even pay them bonuses they advanced them and they said, all right, here's $250,000 advanced. So uh, we'll take that amount of subscription money. And then if you out earn it, that then we'll have a split past then. And they've been able to build a pretty well-read roster of, of folks. Now, obviously, they have, there's a culture kind of war within that. Uh, but in terms of it being a viable business thing, man, I'll tell you what. I think we are getting into an age of post, not opinion, but like post hot takes only kind of culture where like what Substack has really rewarded is like, give me information, right? Give me facts. Like takes are good. A great take is still a great right. take. If, uh, uh, if it ain't got footnotes and hyperlinks, then it's not real information but it's like i found a dude who literally was just a voice that i really trusted in he was like an amateur covid numbers analyzer and i liked the cut of his jib i liked his his perception of how he cut the numbers up and displayed them to me and boom i just became a four dollars and 99 cents follower so i could get two emails from him a week as opposed to one (laughs) and that was like that's a great model for like citizen journalist knows what his value is and he delivers it. Uh, it's yeah, it is a very, it's not as sexy of a space is like when people talk about NFTs or stuff, but when you are a person that has information like that, or, uh, you know, I, you know, a lot of what I do in AI involves like prompt design or something. And I, I, the stuff that you had to talk to these language models, which I make my stuff available everywhere, but I could see somebody who was developing really cool things or code solutions say, Hey, I'm going to have a sub stack where I'm going to charge X dollars a month. And every month you're going to get this really cool thing of a tutorial or whatever that I've explained out how to do. And I think there's a lot of value there. There's so much value for that. I have yet to see, and maybe it's happening, but I think that for people writing fiction, it's a great way to do serialized storytelling because I think that you can have an audience there. And we've seen uh, Amazon just is announced Kindle Vela, by the way, which is now a new platform where you can do serialized. It's an app that will be serialized storytelling where people pay in tokens to read the next chapter, which is another avenue for writers. That's there. And then uh, Apple podcast, paid podcasts. Yeah. Follow this? I I I I have uh, uh Spotify also made an announcement about being able to do uh uh you know paid podcasting. They're also changing a lot of the 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 verbiage. So now we will not tell people to subscribe. Uh we will tell people to follow. Um and uh, uh because subscription will now mean a paid thing. Right. Uh but yeah, I mean I think look, there's there's uh, a wise woman, I think, told uh, uh, Brian and I a long time ago, uh, don't argue with your audience on how they want to pay you. Right. Let give them, them give... all the avenues. Right. Make it as easy as possible for them to give you money. Yeah. Oh, put a lot of buckets in the ocean. And even if some of them gather a little bit and some of them gather a lot, you're going to be very happy that you had a lot of buckets in the ocean when you pour them all in one pot uh, for, for what your take home is. Uh, I would say... 
I don't know exactly. I still can't figure out how to get my uh how to get politics 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 under con- my own control through Apple Connect for whatever reason. I think I I forgot how I initially tried to set it up. But uh, what is Apple Connect? Is that that's Apple's dashboard that shows got it, you got it. Apple podcast numbers. I presume that's also where they're going to handle. So you don't this. know your numbers. <laughs> I know. I know from my end. Right. Like the numbers that you care doing, about, including and, and, how much it separates yeah. out how many Apple listeners I have. Got it. Um, but when I figure that out, uh, uh, I do know my Spotify stuff. So like, I'll be able to say, Hey, if you want to give me money through, uh, uh, Apple, if you want to give me money through Spotify, uh, then you can, I don't know if it'll ever be worth it for me to offer exclusive stuff through there in the way that I offer exclusive stuff through Patreon, through Patreon. Yeah. but, uh, maybe, I mean, I guess that would also, I would be more likely to do it if Patreon just served as my, as my one stop shop to be able to do that, but who knows where this is all going to uh, 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 evolve to. I, 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 all I will say is that whenever I think about saying like, boo, Apple doing this or boo, Spotify, I just have our wise friend say like, why are you denying another bucket in the ocean that's going to collect you money? Right. Even if it's three people that for whatever reason feel more comfortable doing it there and not getting anything in return. No, that is uh, one of those. As soon as we have, uh, uh, you know, a couple of spare minutes to rub together, it's like it's uh, the Modern Road Channel has done very, very well on TikTok. It is a crime against the world that we're not like we just can't spare one human being to carve out this material and take uh, and plant seeds in this fertile territory. That's something that I want to fix very, very quickly. Um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, and plus there's a, a project that, uh, that I'm involved in that's about to launch. And so, uh, this, this topic might be a little bit too precious to me right now to fully, uh, think through in an act to talk things. about monetization. Y- and, yes. Cur- yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, I mean, uh, uh, look, it, it's, I think to Andrew's point of even, uh, of bringing this up, part of what's exciting is that. You know, Brian, you've often said, you know, the middle class rock star is something that the internet can provide for. And holy crap, is that more of a reality now? The more that you've that 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 you have the ability to monetize and also monetize without advertisers. Right. Because that was always the promise or the the, the way that the internet wanted to solve everything was like banner ads dynamic ads right yeah first it was banners and then it was dynamic ads and then it was ads that find you all over the internet and now not only are you seeing the fight between like apple and facebook about the the denial of of some of that data uh you know that that they use to find you but also that never really was a great money play for the little guy it was, it was, it's a big money play if you're a big person serving those kinds of ads. And certainly on YouTube, the ad money at a certain level adds up to something that, you know, is, is a car payment or something like that. And, and can be a lot more if you're a massive uh, 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 success, but the big money has increasingly, even for somebody like you, who's got 2 million plus channels in direct payment. In, in either selling something directly to your consumer or them going on a Patreon, like that is where the money is. And now you've got so many tools to do it, even just starting out. Yeah. That's, it's sort of the thing that we're finding now is that the kind of the law of very large numbers, when you reach a certain scale, you like often you people went to the ad model because nobody wanted to pay, you know, and somebody like, oh, I had a thousand people visit my blog yesterday. And like, well, it's not really a lot because that's a lot of bots. It's a lot of people like, oh, no, this isn't what I want. And then you, you whittle it down to how many people and you started looking at statistics. How many people read the full article? It's like, ah, 50 people. So yeah. I mean, you've got 50 fans there. But when that becomes 50 or 500 or 5000 people that really follow everything you do, well, yeah, there's a number of people willing to reach for their wallet and say, I will pay for this. I think that was the problem early on is people didn't think, no, nobody wants to pay for anything. It's like not as many people were paying attention to you as you thought. Yeah. And and, and that was the hard thing. But there were cases where 
I remember watching niche blogs that had really, really high numbers that could sell, like some of the Mac rumor stuff that really had tremendous numbers were selling their own advertising and doing really well by it. I mean, they didn't understand how to scale. uh, And they realized they were kind of early on to realize like, no, if you have a real dedicated audience, like money is there. And now there's so many other ways to capture that. And it is, it is good. Like, yeah, moving away from the ad model, it's just, that was just one of these things. If you did the math, you realize like every day there's going to be X number more things competing with people's attention and the revenue that you will get is going to decrease. And it's just that slope versus if, if you're providing value, find the ones that like the value and make money. Absolutely. So, uh, so pro and con to the Apple, the Apple podcast saying they kind of want it to be special content for Apple. Doesn't mean it has to be a completely original show, but at, you know, they want it to be ad free or something unique or special. The advantage of getting onto a platform very early is that is sometimes where opportunities can make Joe Rogan, one of the first comedians to start doing a podcast and to realize that he just needs to have interesting conversations and be himself. And this guy's become, you know, a not not just a leading health expert, uh, but has become a. <laughs> it's, it's, I think you know when you get criticized, he's like, "Hey, I'm an effing imbecile. Like, don't listen to me." You know, like that's a great defense. Um, so, I I would like to just demonstrate a a flow chart. Uh, did you hear an opinion? Yes. Was it from somebody affiliated with the UFC? Yes. Don't pay attention to it. <laughs> like, unless it's about fighting professionally in a cage, like then anything else with a grain of salt, whenever a yeah. UFC fighter has a political opinion, ah, grain of salt. Eh, if it's about kicking somebody in the face, listen to them. They probably they know a lot about kicking somebody in the face. So being being early and consistent can be helpful. Sometimes there are people who are pre YouTube who are doing video on the web, but the problem they had was it, the cost of trying to distribute videos is expensive. There weren't algorithms to really promote you or get you there. Being too early on YouTube while well, people are still trying to figure it out, but after a period of time, podcasting, etc., doing stuff consistently over time. And so there is an opportunity, I think, with Kindle Vela and Amazon Podcast subscriptions is in the Spotify too is. Uh, you know, being there early on, you often get featured if you're doing quality content. You know, I, I had a friend that got favored by the Google Plus gods. Yeah. And boy, man, that was, that, 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 was, that was a great run. Those <laughs> were the <laughs> days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. Those Google Plus friends, they always oh. showed up. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I would say if if you are are serious about trying stuff then then go out try it i mean i don't know I, 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 the apple podcast stuff is is interesting i i have my questions about apple's commitment to podcasting in general because they don't have a stellar track record like podcasting is something that by every uh, uh, metric they should have owned personally for for years decade over a decade ago if if they had not if they had done anything uh in that space uh instead they kept their podcast department to a stout two people i'm <laughs> presuming it's bigger these days now that services are a bigger part of their revenue model and now that is a penny that they want to pick up off the ground but uh I don't know. I mean, look, Spotify's doing it. Apple's doing it. They're in competition with each other. Uh, who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to fade, you know, if it's going to, you know, go or whatever. But I do think that if you're thinking about launching something or doing something, might be the worst decisions to make. Hmm. So, don't know. It's exciting. Gentlemen, do you have any picks? Um, yeah, dude, Invincible. It's great. I watched the whole thing again. Uh, you should watch it. Uh, I got a podcasting pick. I use uh, a service called Fireside FM. It's uh, put together by uh, Dan Benjamin, uh, uh, and I like it quite a bit. Easy way that you can distribute your podcast. It's podcast hosting, so another service like uh, 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 
Anchor or something like that. Uh, uh, but so far, I've really enjoyed the UI. Importing everything has been pretty easily, uh, pretty easy, and and you get good data. I watched, went and watched through all three of the extended edition Lord of the Rings, which I love. Yeah. I think they're just cinematically great. And I'm like, all right, let me go watch the Hobbit movies again. And um, funny thing. Mm -hmm. uh no my opinion did not change ah. uh, I, I, okay uh, but what's gonna happen what? to oin gloin and the other one <laughs> no you want to know this is worse so i watched the first one made it through cool then i watched the second time one in that river a lot of time in that river in the first one yeah and then i watched the second and i'm like i don't remember a lot of this and i guess i only saw it the once and then I went to watch the, the the Desolation of Smog. Like, I think I remember parts of it. I'm vague. And then I go to watch the third one, and I realize I'd never watched it. Oh, I wow. never made it that far. Oh, my God. Uh, I, 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 I never, I'm like, I didn't realize I never made it to the third one. Like, And that, I'm like, whoa. Like, uh if I did, it's maybe it was a movie I like I fell asleep in or something. I don't know. Cause like I literally like, nope, never seen this, never seen this, never seen this. So uh it's it's stretch. It's stretch. Well, and it it's stretch. it would be fine if the characters looked like characters and not people in prosthetics. And when you watch the behind the scenes and you see the actual actors, I'm like, just Give them bulkier shoulders and maybe dwarfify them a little bit. But all of that, it was really a case of like, you see, you're watching actors and stuff like, I don't feel like there's a person there. There's a good voice. Yeah. And it kind of, but actually make them real people. I mean, I don't know, not really literally people, but they just like, I still don't know other names. Yeah. It's funny. I've read, the, I've, I've read the book. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Corey. Uh, no, it's, it's funny because we watched the uh, uh, original trilogy with my daughter and she's eight years old. Even the extended edition, she set through all of it, loved it, loved every second of it. As soon as we start watching the uh, the uh, the newer ones, <laughs> um, wow, she got bored really quick. It was just in the first scene, she's like, "What's what is happening here?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Hey, buckle up, we got three more of these." <laughs> and it's it's a beloved book, and I can remember I read the book, wrote all the books, but and I, I'm not like a big huge oh I know they do look, but like yeah, yeah, it was. I, I mean, I'm glad I, I actually have like 15 minutes left, you know, because like I kind of we had an ending, but I think no, I, I made it through. I did make it through. I'm sorry. I did finish it last night. I mean, um, look, it was when when they were going to split The Hobbit into two movies, everybody was like, oh, Jesus, that's stretching, stretch two movies. It's not a long book. It, it's got a couple cool parts in it, uh, uh, but I think it's got like two cool parts in it. So you're just going to save the two parts for the two movies. Oh, uh, OK. And then. Uh, uh, what's his butt settled his lawsuit with New Line Cinema to to bring him back to do The Hobbit, and then all of a sudden The Hobbit became a trilogy because they wanted to make the most amount of money that they could because it was another Lord of the Rings thing, and it's like, yeah, like everyone I, saw that coming. Well, remember Gil, Guillermo del Toro was supposed to do it, yep. and then the three. Here is my crit of this was like they, somebody mentioned like the forty five minute dishwashing scene in the beginning. The problem is that it's a lovely book. <laughs> It's a lovely book. And they wanted to make a trilogy, which means you've got to then change the story and you can't just try to do the literal part of that book first. Like, give us young Thorn Oakenshield. Give us this story, not flashbacks. Like, you, there is much of our criticism of Falcon Winter Soldier. There's a way to tell the story. But you have to tell a story. Yeah. And not, you know, so. Uh, you know about Amazon, right? In Lord of the Rings. Yeah, like a billion dollars they're putting into the. Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, to to essentially series. buy the world, but none of the plots. Like, uh, yes. they, they like they're buying a player's handbook for D and D. They paid one hundred and fifty million dollars for no. it, and now they get to make. Jeez, uh, wow, it's, it's bonkers. Although, like, but now they're kind of they also bought themselves to be free of like you screwed up the thing. Like, yeah, but can, what. I'm I'm reading like uh, Raymond Feist right now, the magician. Just kind of get into. It. I'm like, oh, I'm digging this. Like, like that's cool IP. I'm like, that's got elves and stuff and cool IP. The Witcher was great IP. Like yeah. Witcher, like oh, when's the Witcher? Next Witcher? 
I want the next yeah. Witcher yeah. season. I, I loved season one. That was great. That's like yeah. the best fantasy thing on TV since Game of Thrones. Like Game of Thrones was this. They didn't pay two hundred fifty million dollars of the rights to that, and and but what they did, they'd pay a lot though, and they got this great story, this great thing to lay a story on top of, and that's part of the problem. Is it's like video game stuff. Like ah, oh, we'll we'll tell a story in this world. But what's the story? Ah, eh, we'll make one up because our writers are just as good as these guys who wrote these things, which you know stood the test of time over fifty years. That's my fear about the Amazon thing. Like, so what did you buy? You like to use the names of stuff that other fantasy writers have created their own versions of, you don't get the stories. So you're just going to, I hope it works out, but like, you're just going to throw a bunch of TV writers in a room and they're going to make an Epic as good as Lord of the Rings. Uh, Disney plus is on the line. They would like to talk to you about how difficult it is to uh, do something with a world and none of the characters. Although they, they, I mean, look, look how many stumbles they had with the, the 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 individual movies and the the new trilogy or whatever before we finally got to the Mandalorian uh they bought a world and then they just you know kept wanting to say remember those other guys they were cool yeah and then uh we'll see you know that you know what they're working on right uh it, 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 friggin' five different spin-offs of the one no six... fantasy fantasy do you know what fantasy thing they're doing no willow Oh yeah, no, I, I don't want to talk the about this anymore. The beloved great fantasy movie Willow that was—it's <laughs> one of those things you like because you're a kid. And wake it was me up when there's a, the an expanded Time Bandits universe. That's what I want. Oh, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Cut it off before the Chill election Chill swell. <laughs> remake Time Bandits remake because oh, there was supposed to be one of the. All right, damn it. All right. Come on. It's Apple been after TV. <laughs> Apple TV's doing the Time Bandits remake. Oh, uh -huh. I don't know how to feel about that. Oh yeah. Oh oh, and they uh, they got Taika Waititi to work on it. Oh, never mind. I know exactly how to feel about it. <laughs> All right, quick, say say the thing. I have to go. Yeah, he's got to write and direct the pilot, but this is 2019. <laughs> God knows what's going on. So, it's uh, any other fix? Anything else? No. It's been after. Yeah. All right. So if we're shooting ads at four thirty, then I only got a tight window to to run. go. All yeah. right, go, 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 go. How, how, run. How tight? How tight is your window, Brian? All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Brian is desperately trying to bring this broken laptop back to health, and now just going to find various charging ports. Uh, all right, guys, thank you so much uh, okay. for, for hanging out with us, as always. Court Killer's coming up a little bit later, and uh, we will have a ghost attack for you in the audio feeds uh, as maybe some video may uh, begins, but uh, uh, fun stuff in the offing. See y'all later. Y'all.